Welcome to the This Is Horror Show. I'm Michael Wilson, and I'm joined with my co-host, Dan Howarth. Evening. Evening, Michael. Evening, Dan. Evening. Evening, Jeff. So, I know to start with, if you could just tell us a little bit about who you are and what it is you do. I know that there's a whole host of different things that you do. So, I mean, as a publisher, editor, author events coordinator this could take a while but please <laughs> and, yeah, and teach you as well yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, well i'm a small press publisher based in australia um, i've been a writer for a long time now i've been published for five six years um i've trained in editing and writing and started my own editing business, which then grew into a publishing business and an event business with running haunted creative retreats in abandoned lunatic asylums, <laughs> which are always fun. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm small press for a year now and we're doing reasonably well. Touch wood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, prior to that, you were also the... Uh, president of the Australian Horror Writers Association for a number of years. Yes, two years, 2011 to 2013. I was the third president of there, and we did some really good things over those years. It's a great association, small but very vocal and very loyal to all the other members. That was a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I don't, to kick off, it would be a good idea to talk a little bit about the Australian horror scene. I mean, obviously having been the AHWA president and your This Is Horror column focuses a lot within the Australian horror scene, it seemed like a good idea to talk with you about that. So as a kind of initial question to kick off, I wondered... How would you say the Australian scene differs from both the UK and the American scene? It's so much smaller. So very, very much smaller. With the AWA, the AHWA, has a rough membership of around 200 compared to a couple of thousand with the HWA. And I'm sure at least as many writers in the UK who class themselves as horror genre writers. Um, there's, we're very spread out. It's a, a fairly large country with a fairly small population around the most of the East Coast and the, the Southern Coast. So there's always big distances between the, the writers. And the, the AWA was created by Marty Young to try and bridge that gap and give people a, a way to connect with other writers within the genre. And it's done extremely well. And who do you think are the most exciting people writing within Australian horror at the moment? Oh, there's so many. Uh, you've got Greg Beck, who's internationally published uh, with Military Horror, which tends to be my specialty when I publish as well. Um, we've got Kylie Chan, Lucy Sussex, Karen Warren, Jack Dan, who's now uh, an honorary Australian. Uh, there's, uh, there's Alan Baxter, who's just been published internationally by HarperCollins. Uh, there's a small number of people who seem to have a big sway in the industry and there's a lot of people who are up and coming. Uh, it's very hard to get published here in Australia. The, 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 publish, the main publishers, the big five, tend to forget about genre work. So a lot of people, and there's very few small presses as well, so a lot of the writers tend to sub to overseas markets. So who, who are Which the I've, small presses in the Australian scene that you think are worth kind of exploring and looking into? Uh, we've got Ticonderoga, who've been around for 20 years. Lots of awards there. Um, you've got 12th Planet Press, who have swept the awards since they first started. They, they tend more toward the literary horror. Mm. And they've done really, really well with writers like Karen Warren sweeping the Shirley Jacksons, uh, H w, the um, Bram Stokers, uh, the Australian Horror Awards, the Australian the um, the Shadows Awards. I probably should have. What, what was that? <laughs> that? That was my that was my phone. That's amazing. Phone. I, 
<laughs> Probably should have put it on silent beforehand. It is Homer oh screaming. Yeah. <laughs> it gets a few looks when it goes off in chops. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what, Jeff? That that sounded like the door to your dungeon had crept <laughs> open and you could hear the screams from within then. <laughs> I deny everything. I do. I seriously <laughs> deny everything. <laughs> Close that door, guys. <laughs> um, back to um, publishers. Um, dare I mention my own, Cohesion Press? We're, we're selling a few books, but I don't want to seem too self-promoting. Um, we've got uh, Satellite Publishing, who aren't focused specifically on, on the horror genre, but they have released a few. You've got uh, International Fantasy Writers Guild, IFWG Publishing Australia, which, again, hasn't focused on horror, but they're releasing a, a collection by one of our more renowned horror writers, um, Robert Hood, early in this year. Um, Rob Hood is a, a fairly good, very good Cthulhu and, and zombie genre, especially, writer. So they're bringing out this 20-year collection, 20 years in writing, two volumes or one great big signed limited edition. So the, the, the press here in Australia has been fairly focused on just a few small presses. And a couple of those have sort of withdrawn over the last few years, uh, like Dark Prince Press, which has published quite extensively for a long time, but they've now drawn their focus completely back into young adult and, and school curriculum focused books and um, that's it there's very few small presses over here and the big presses tend to go with the the popular fiction genre they tend to publish the American and the British stuff as opposed to the Australian stuff which is a bit sad mm. so I wanted to talk about how Coesium Press got started. Now, I suspect from your previous answer that a lot of that was indeed seeing this gap in the market where there just aren't many Australian uh, genre presses out there. Yes and no. My wife, I've, I've wanted to publish for a while and my wife said to me one night, look, just publish a damn book. Why don't you just start a small press? And, yeah, okay, how hard can it be? And then you know, I worked out, hard, <laughs> worked out how hard it could be. And it's a lot of work. But I don't, I mean, we're, we're a small press that are based in Australia, but our focus is global. Most of our sales are in the US or through US Amazon, at least, where a lot of Australians still make their purchases, although they're trying to drive us to amazon.com.au successfully sometimes, other times not so successfully. But I see us as a small press in the world. I've networked with writers for a long time, 10 years, and that that combined with my my um, network through the Australian Horror Writers Association for a couple of years has given me a, a good base of people to ask, hey, can you please give me a really cool story, original story for one of our anthologies and we'll pay you really well. And they've <laughs> taken to that. We've had yeah. writers like... <laughs> Jonathan Mabry and Western Oaks, um, Greg Beck, Australian writer I mentioned earlier, um, James Moore, who's written extensively in movie tie-ins and such, people like Jeremy Robinson, uh, Bob Mayer, all world-class writers of the subgenre that we're pretty much focusing in now, military horror. And what was it so, that made you decide to focus on military horror? I love the stuff. <laughs> I love reading it. So <laughs> if I'm going to be reading 8 million words submitted for an anthology, I want it to be stuff I like. <laughs> so, and there is a, 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 there was a niche left there. There was writers who were selling really well. Jonathan Mabry, prime example, he's, he's really a bestseller and he writes military horror, but there was nobody focusing really on the military horror anthologies. Uh, you've got sci-fi military. There's that's you no know, since Ender's Game. That's really been a big thing, and before that, it's been a big thing as well. But nobody was really focusing on the military horror side. So I thought, why not? There's a niche there. I'll take it. Thank you very much. So who would you um, who would you recommend then as people who are kind of new to military horror fiction? Where would be kind of either the books? Obviously, feel free to recommend some of your own here, Jeff, as well. Um, <laughs> What would be the books that you'd kind of point people towards as a good place to start? 
Well, the two I mentioned earlier, Wes Oaks and Jonathan Mabry, are both great. Wes, uh, Western Oaks has the SEAL Team 666 series. And he's just had the third one released. That's actually set over in the UK as well, with King Arthur as an antagonist. Quite cool. Um, it's a military SEAL team that's specifically tasked with fighting supernatural threats that, that threaten the US and the world. Uh, you've got Jonathan Mabry, who, um, who writes the Joe Ledger series, they're based around a, a secret organisation, the Department of Military Science, that is tasked with fighting the threats to the world that are so futuristic science, they almost seem horrific and supernatural in and of themselves. Both very fast-paced, action, um, plot-driven, still with strong characters, but it never lets up. And Wes, his SEAL Team 666, is currently looking like it's going to be made into a fairly big budget movie with um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson in the lead role. So that should do wonders for the Ameri for the um, military horror scene, definitely. And Snafu, cool. our series of anthologies, we've got these writers in them. So if you want to have a look at who's around and the, the breadth and scope of military horror, it's a great place to start. We've got two out now with the third one out at the end of this month. And they're all reasonably priced, and they're all between seventy and one hundred and twenty thousand words of military horror novellas and short stories. And so I was looking into Snafu before we came on the air, and I was actually looking on Amazon. And you mentioned previously that a lot of your audience is from the U.S. And I, I noticed that there were twenty-seven reviews on the U.S. Amazon, but then you only had two in Australia and four in the UK so I'm wondering did you have any kind of strategies to to uh, target the US audience or is this just kind of organically where they came from this has been pretty much organic my thoughts when I first started Snafu was to get three or four renowned writers with an established fan base in each of the anthologies and that way they'd mention that they were in them and we'd pick up their fan base because they'd grab the snafu for the story from the writer they like and with luck they'd like the whole anthology and then pick up the rest. I'm getting different guys in each one, a couple of crossovers here and there because I particularly like the story and I want to see another one in that same mythos. But that particular strategy, especially with the, the, the biggest name writers, has worked really well so far. So it's just a matter of getting enough income in from those, and they're breaking even. I spend a fair bit on each one. You've got to pay these guys well to get original stories from them. Um, once I do, I'll start advertising more so, especially in the UK and Europe, because I think that's a market that's pretty much not well tapped in regards to Snafu at this point and military horror in general. Now, I know that quite a few people who are listening might be either running their own small press or looking at starting one up. Now, you said that you have to pay these writers well, of, of course, with them being professionals and big names, but I, I mean, feel free if you don't want to answer on, on the podcast, but what kind of rates are we looking at for some of the bigger names? And then, as a contrast, what kind of rate would you pay like the the lesser less established names for these anthologies? Well, looking at Snafu One, which um, the Snafu Two we're putting out in June, um, the Survival of the Fittest, I'm actually paying more. But Snafu One, I paid above pro rates, and pro rates as classed by the Science Fiction Writers of America and the HWA are uh, five to six cents US per word. So it was quite expensive. I spent six grand on Snafu putting it together, and that was purely paying the writers. And the solicited stories, I paid three cents a word. For Snafu 2, Survival of the Fittest, where we've upped that to four cents a word, and I'm paying a couple of cents more per word to each of the solicited writers as well, which takes it up to seven and eight cents per word. So quite expensive. I'm looking at spending eight grand on the, the next big Snafu. And so it's, it's a bit to make back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I mean, how is that going at the moment? Are you managing to make a profit or break even? Um, we made our money back on the on the original Snafu 
around the end of the year. So within six months, we'd made our money back, which isn't too bad for publishing. Mm. And one other thing I actually tempted the writers with, something to give them a little bit extra hook to get them and also keep them promoting us, was I offered a percentage of royalties to each of the, the four big names in Snafu 1 and the five big names in Snafu Survival of the Fittest. So that's an ongoing thing. That's for good. They'll always get a percentage of royalties from each of those, which increases the workload for me, of course, but it also keeps them focused on advertising and it keeps them coming back. If they can see they're making money out of it as an ongoing thing, they're going to be more than willing to, to give me stuff in the future. And that's what I want. I want to build this up long term into something that, that benefits everybody. Oh, yeah. And if they've got a royalty rate rather than just being paid and then they're done, then as you say, they're going to be invested in looking at marketing and promoting it because, you know, there's something at stake, at stake for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I looked at that and I thought, well, we're going to lose a lot of money out of that, but we're also going to make a lot of money because they're going to keep promoting. And each time we release something, the people who, the new fan bases will then see the old fan bases as well, because the, the old books as well, because the newer ones are promoting the older ones and the older ones are promoting the newer ones and it's a great big promotion circle. So given that you're running a publishing house, you're doing freelance editing, you're writing your own fiction, there's these paranormal events that you're putting on, what kind of, what does a, a day look like for you or perhaps even a week? I'm wondering how you divide your time and, and just how, how the bigger picture in terms of your life looks. <laughs> Life, yes, that would be lovely. <laughs> um, I'm up usually about 6.30 every morning. I'm on the, uh, sit down, have a coffee and cigarette, which is one of my few remaining bad habits. Um, get on a computer about 7, answer emails and stuff, which are coming overnight because dealing a lot with people overseas, I get a lot of stuff throughout overnight from different time zones. So there's usually 10, 15, 20 emails that need to be answered in the morning. I'll hop on Facebook and, and such and just take care of a little bit of promotion, a little bit of networking, chat to some of the authors, um, interact, post a few memes on some threads, as you do. <laughs> um, and then probably I'll I'll um, go grab a one of my few treats every day. I'll go grab a, a proper cappuccino coffee about nine ten o'clock and from that point onwards it's work all day i'll either be doing layout for clients i'll be doing layout for the next cohesion press book or i'll be um editing for clients or again reading submissions for snafu and that goes on often on throughout the whole day i'm on facebook all the time to answer questions from readers to catch um, private messages from authors that I've queried about future snafus. I've got people lined up all the way through to 2017 at this point for upcoming editions of snafu. Huh. Um, and yeah, it's just a, a hodgepodge of InDesign desktop publishing program, um, editing in Word and talking trash on Facebook <laughs> through <laughs> till probably 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. And that's seven seven days a week. Yeah, so, I mean, rather than having a kind of regimented, this is the time that I edit, this is the time where I do layout, it's more whatever uh, the needs necessitate on a day-to-day -day basis. Is that about right? Pretty much it's prioritising the, the things that need to be done by the due dates mm. that are required. And I'll just get things done. I, I like to be at least a, a week in advance of when things are due. Sometimes I'm close to closer than that, but I've never been overdue with any deadlines. Um, and yeah, it's just a matter of I'm um, sort of short attention span, so I just swap and change in between things. I've usually got, always got InDesign open. I've got Word open, and I'll just do what strikes my fancy in any hour of the day. I get bored with editing. I'll jump on InDesign and do a bit more layout. I get bored with that. I jump on Facebook and. And talk to a few people. I mean, plenty of writers groups, and I tend to be asked a lot of advice from a few people and for help with things that I'm good at that they're not, and in return they'll help me with things they're good at. And it's just a great big cesspool of 
mixed work all day, every day, <laughs> and then teaching as well. I teach part-time at the local um, tertiary college, teach editing and publishing. So that's starting soon, probably another three weeks, and I'm back to classes there, six hours a week. Mm. And what, where does your fiction writing fall into the prioritisation? Um, I tend to write late at night. I'll probably get an hour in every night after I, I shut everything else down and just disconnect the internet from the computer so I'm not even tempted. And, yeah, I'll just hack away for two, you know, one, 2,000 words a night and it's slowly building up. I'm halfway through a military horror uh, novel of myself of my own, but when I finish it, I've got the, the wonderful task of finding a publisher because mm. there's no way I'm going to publish my own stuff. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that can be... I mean, a, a bit of a flaw if you do start publishing your own things. It can end very messily, but then I guess for for every kind of 20 failed stories, you then see people like David Moody, who became established with Galanz and has now, um, well, restarted his own press and is putting out his own stories through infected books. So I guess for some people it does work. Absolutely, and for David Moody, he was a you know he had is established. He was a self publisher first, up, wasn't he? And then mm -hmm. he was picked up by Galance. He had an established fan base, so why not start a press publishing your own stuff at that point? Whereas I'm, I'm <laughs> as a writer, I'm not really well known at all. I wouldn't say I'm a nobody, but I'm I'm a nobody. I'm pretty close to a nobody. <laughs> so I think it'd be looked viewed differently, and. Uh, when I was first writing, it was during the stage where self-publishing was still looked down upon. It's nowhere near as disreputable as it was, but I'm still stuck. And I think a publisher who publishes themselves without themselves being well-known is looked at differently than a publisher who is a renowned writer who then puts out their own mm. stuff. Yeah, I think there's something to be said for going that traditional route proving yourself and then saying right well I'm established at this point I have the fan base I've done the maths and you know what if I put out my own stuff I'm going to get more of the check at the end of the day absolutely absolutely but they've already as you said they've already proven themselves mm. they've shown that other people are more than happy to commercially publish them so there is that difference so what's coming up for Cohesion in 2015, apart from the other Snafu anthology? Or are you exclusively kind of focusing on Snafu at the moment? I'm focusing fairly heavily on Snafu because it takes so much time. Like I said earlier, 8 million words I received in submissions for Snafu Survival of the Fittest. And I read most of those, and it, it took so long to go <laughs> through them. So very long. Um, we're opening up a, a comic in print. That's one thing we are doing. We've got one comic that's already it, it's being lettered at the moment, which is I'm doing the lettering as well. So, hey, it's not like I've got enough to do. Find something else. Um, <laughs> and we're contracted to put out a comic version of a novella by a fairly renowned writer. I won't go any further into that just yet until we make the formal announcement, but it's looking really good and it involves werewolves. <laughs> Uh, we've got some a, a couple of great artists on board, um, and we're also organising the creative retreats. We've got one in April, which is pretty well organised at this point, and we're looking at another one over the Halloween weekend, which would be a fantastic time to stay on site in a haunted asylum, really, wouldn't it? Yeah, Just like yeah. a movie. <laughs> uh, as long what as somebody possibly doesn't go run. run. Exactly. As long as somebody can run, doesn't quite run as fast as me, I'm set. So this you, is one slow person. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about these creative re retreats? I mean, the, the most haunted series on This Is Horror is actually amongst some of our most popular articles. Yes, they've really done well, haven't they? Um, well, we started off at Aradale Lunatic Asylum, or Aradale Mental Hospital, which was previously known as Ararat Lunatic Asylum. It was built back in the 1860s, a massive 
massive building. Uh, it housed in its peak 1,500 patients and another 600 staff. So you can imagine the size and scope of the building. 63 different buildings, mostly connected by walkways and tunnels and all sorts of scary things. And we hired that out exclusively for weekends to host up to 30 writers, artists, filmmakers, creatives of any sort, and gave them free run of the place. We organised ghost tours from the people who run the ghost tours there, and it was scary as hell. <laughs> it's a really creepy place. It, it, it's quite daunting during the day, but when you're walking through the men's ward by yourself at three in the morning with nothing but a little torch, and you hear the footsteps behind you and the shadows are moving up at the other end of the corridor, and you think, oh my God, get me out of here. I don't want to die. <laughs> it's really, really scary. So we ran those a couple of years, and that was initially run through the Australian Horror Writers Association. I started that uh, to, as a fundraiser for the AWA. And when I left the AWA, the AWA were focused more on different fundraising avenues, so I continued to run them myself. I wasn't going to miss out on that opportunity. I just loved staying at the places. They're amazing. We, um, we run two now. We've run Aradale and we run Beechworth Mental Asylum, which is Mayday Hills, also very similar in style and you know, both built within a year of each other. So uh, we've got an actual cottage that is all ours at, at Beechworth. It's, there's 11 bedrooms and a couple of big areas for a common room. There's an internal courtyard and everything and it's just as old as the rest of the building, 150 years old. And it's just amazing. We get full access to all the, the areas and we can just wander around. It's right next door to the most haunted building in Beechworth as well, Grevillea, which one of our challenges while we're there is, hey, would, are you happy to be put in a straitjacket and locked in Grevillea by yourself at midnight? <laughs> I lasted three minutes before I was trying to chew my way out the front door. <laughs> Very scary place. So we run workshops during the day. We give people time to to do their own writing. It's a great place for writers to just sit down and talk and, and workshop each other's styles and, and short stories and just get inspired to write. It's a beautiful area, especially Beechworth in the mountains and just looking out over the, the valleys and, and, and rifts. And then you've got the haunted asylum at night. <laughs> so we take people on paranormal investigations as well while they're there. One night is a ghost tour, the other night is a paranormal investigation with all the ghost hunting equipment and everything, and that goes for a few hours. That's good fun. We've had some real strange experiences at, at a couple of them, and I found the most haunted places were actually the staff quarters. Oh, right. Uh, they were, it was bizarre. We'd be walking along the third floor, middle of the night, and all of a sudden an old woman would say hello out of a room that's obviously empty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some really creepy staff quarters there. And these are all things that you found when you were doing your investigations? Oh, just wandering around and doing the investigations and everything. There's been so many things that, I mean, I, I tend to be sceptical. I'll always look for the most obvious explanation and then the least obvious explanation that's not a ghost. And 90% of the time, yeah, absolutely. It's just purely my imagination. I did not see that shadow at the end of the hall. But 5 or 10% of the time, there's things you just can't explain. And I don't know what they are. I, I just have no explanation whatsoever, but sometimes they're creepy. And Gravillia, the room where I was locked in, the, the building I was locked in in the straitjacket, that just creeps me out. I was in there by myself and the doors started opening and I heard footsteps shuffling towards me. And I know I was in there by myself because we had the keys. All the guys outside had the keys and I just ran to the front door and let me out of here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's a great atmosphere for inspiration for some really moody and atmospheric storytelling it's great too in the day it's beautiful it's situated in beautiful gardens and there's rotundas around you can sit in and the view is magnificent but at night it just takes on a whole different aspect yeah well i was going to say i mean i would imagine uh irrespective of your beliefs with regards to the supernatural and you know whether you do or don't feel that you experience anything there i just imagine being in that setting must really kind of bring out the best in terms of just creepy atmospheric horror it does i mean 
even if you don't believe in in the paranormal, buildings that have seen that much torture, for lack of a better word, the way that people with mental illness and people who were just different were treated over the years, it can't help but absorb some of the emotions. And that that's what it feels like at night. It feels like there's a million souls screaming for release from everything they've gone through. It's really quite overbearing at times. Oh, it sounds fantastic, you know, for the <laughs> for the horror enthusiast and certainly uh, when I'm over in Australia, it'd be worth kind of coinciding that with one of these retreats, I think. Absolutely. I mean, these buildings, is, they're as creepy and as old as most anything that's still around and still accessible on that level to stay in. And there's nothing else like them in Australia, and there's certainly nothing else like what we run for the creative retreats in Australia. And I've, I've looked around in America, and they, yeah, there's a couple of haunted mansion creative retreats, but how can a mansion possibly compare to a massive lunatic asylum that's 150 years old? You know, it's just, <laughs> there's no comparison. <laughs> We've really got it nicely tied down here, and we have no trouble filling them either. <laughs> <laughs> and and for those who are listening and are interested in signing up, where can they get the details and what cost are they looking at? Uh, well, we're looking at fully catered for the whole three days and two nights is three hundred and ninety-five Australian dollars, so around two hundred pound that it'd be, I think, roughly, maybe two uh, two fifty, maybe. Um, there's full details on the Cohesion Editing website, which is just www.cohesionediting, C-O-H-E-S-I-O-N-E-D-I-T-I-N-G, or one word, dot com. And also on the Cohesion Press Facebook page and Cohesion Editing Facebook page. There's even a, a specific Facebook page, Asylum Creative Retreats. So if you just search on Facebook for that, you'll find us. Ah, that sounds absolutely brilliant. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'd, I'd do it even if we didn't make a profit. We don't make a big profit. We keep the price as low as we can. I just enjoy spending the weekends mm. at the places. It's <laughs> fantastic. And it's fully catered as well. The whole weekend, everything, all you have to do is bring your, your writing equipment, whether it be pen and paper or a laptop, and just write and explore and hunt ghosts. And which writers have you got confirmed for the next retreat? Um, we haven't. Uh, we had Karen Warren at one of them, but we have, actually haven't focused on getting any big name writers at this point. We're looking at doing a week long retreat for that and look at novels. But these ones are just for people to come along. We've got a lot of repeat customers. There are some people who have been to every single one we've ran, and they just keep coming back. They love it. And people coming from you know, eight hundred thousand kilometres away, catching planes down just for the weekend, so they can go to these things. So we're doing pretty good. <laughs> they must like. They must mm. like something about it. Speaking of authors, I was quite excited when I was looking at the upcoming names for Snafu anthologies, and I saw S. D. Perry. Now, I ah, first, yes, I, Danielle. Yeah, <laughs> that was I, a real coup. I first came across the work through the Resident Evil uh, video game novelizations, uh, because I mean that that was one of the first video games that just for me really encapsulated everything the horror genre is about and I became quite a big fanboy of that series so of course <laughs> when I was younger picked up those novelizations so then when I saw S.D. Perry <laughs> on, the, on the cover of these cohesion releases I, <laughs> it kind of brought back some memories for me yes yeah no I, I, I very much targeted her, her name's Stephanie Danielle Perry. She prefers Danielle. I targeted Danielle. I've known her on Facebook. I actually connected because I was all fanboy over it as well. Right. Um, <laughs> Resident Evil games I love. And two days until the High Definition remake is released, I'm downloading it at the moment, ready oh, for the, yes. the unlocking. I cannot wait. And I'm going to actually take a few days off when that comes, finally. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> yeah, and I just asked Danielle if she'd be interested in submitting something for a survival horror anthology, and she was she was quite, quite happy to. She'd actually never been asked to submit to an anthology before. She was surprised that somebody actually considered her worthy to, to take part in an anthology, and I was very happy to have her 
very, very happy. She's a great writer, and I've got all the little seven of the Resident Evil novelizations as well. I tend to read them every year. Absolutely love them. So that was a very targeted thing for me, and I was happy to have her. And it's the first time we've worked through a, a New York agent as well, which she has. So all negotiations initially were through her agent, although actually I'm chat with her quite a bit on Facebook now, which is just really cool because I yeah, grew up reading her stuff, all the aliens, alien books she put out, all the mm -hmm. alien versus predator, and of course the Resident Evil, and a ton of Star Wars stuff, sorry, Star Trek stuff as well. So, so she's quite well published. Yeah, is I this guess. one of her first kind of original, you know, not original, but original kind of world pieces then? It sounds like she's, a lot of her previous work has been kind of done in the you know, the novelization or the setting of, you know, a different yeah, universe. Absolutely. Nearly all of her work has been in uh, movie and game tie-ins. She's written one original novel, but this will be, yeah, her, her first work that focuses strongly on action military horror. So oh, cool. I'm really proud to have that as part of Snafu. Nice one. How many of those novelizations have you read, Michael? Because I imagine that would be, you know your thing being the resident evil tattoo sporting fanboy that you are <laughs> yeah I've, i i've read all of the novelizations dan it was quite a long time ago now but i mean back in the day if it had resident evil on i was picking it up i had the novelizations i had the comic books i i bought the soundtracks which to be fair i still listen to the soundtracks i mean i think yeah, taking them on their own is particularly with the first three Resident Evils, so where they're all very orchestral based, they're fantastic pieces of music. Yeah, I Yeah, you, you love a good soundtrack, don't you, Michael? Something like that then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I wonder how you have the soundtracks as well, else. I have to admit. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the comics and the books. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah Michael's one of the few people boy. that Michael's one of the few people that drives around blasting out the sinister soundtrack out of his windows in the summer. Well, uh, you, you know yeah, how I much too. I like the sinister. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I... uh... sorry, Jeff, go on. I was going to say, yeah, the soundtracks of, of some of the games, especially the early Resident Evil games, were just amazing. They were very orchestral and very atmospheric, so great for writing as well. I tend to put them on a lot when I'm writing. I mean, I think with, as is the case with pretty much every Resident Evil fan that has been there from the start, I'm very much hoping that we get a return to the more survival horror-based gameplay. Uh, which, which, to be fair, I did think that the Evil Within helped fill that gap, but I, I know that the Evil Within has really divided people in terms of how they felt about it. How did you get on with it? I really like it, but God, it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, I mean, the, the way that I describe the Evil Within is it felt like the creator of Resident Evil had made Silent Hill. And to be fair, I think that is exactly what it was. Yeah, that's a very apt description of it. It is, it's got that whole surrealist feel of Silent Hill, yet it's got the total feel of survival horror that Resident Evil best encapsulated. I'm a big Silent Hill fan as well, so oh, yeah. that works for me. I just wish it wasn't so hard. It just takes <laughs> so long to get through each stage. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, Resident Evil and Silent Hill are the two staple horror games I, I i always find it very difficult to to choose a favorite i mean i think it, it has it does have to be resident evil but there, there's not a lot in it um in terms of consistency throughout the years silent hill has kind of kept that standard i would say whereas there's been a few dips within the resident evil games um but Excited with The Evil Within, obviously hugely excited about the HD remake, and, you know, ev every year when people are talking about Resident Evil, the fans are saying, remake the second Resident Evil. I'm still, oh, yes. I'm still holding out <laughs> that that happens. 
I hope so. I've got it on um, the game, uh, the GameCube. Oh and yeah, I love it. It was easily the best. Oh, not easily, but it was the best of the whole series for me. It had such t- two such strong storylines, which mm. have great crossovers throughout. And you think you've finished, and all of a sudden you've got the second disc with the the second entire gameplay through it. So yeah, the remake of Resident Two would be a real fanboy moment for me, definitely. And I think that, I mean, we're kind of coming back to fiction now because you said it. Yeah, you know, it had two fantastic stories, and. And I completely agree, and I think that's actually a huge part of what makes uh, the the Resident Evil series so brilliant. The fact that they are all, all about brilliant stories and narratives, and that, that complements the fantastic uh, soundtrack, the gameplay, and of course the scares. Absolutely. That was one thing I really liked about Danielle Perry's writing. She managed to get the sometimes illogical game logic and to turn that into something within the narrative of the books that that made sense. I mean, not always 100% sense, but you're working with game logic here and that doesn't always work out well at all within a narrative tale. And she did really well for that, I thought. So that's why I'm, I'm, it was a commercial decision. I mean, her name is recognisable to fans of the genre, to anybody who reads Alien and Predator and, and Star Trek. But I also I knew she was a damn fine writer, so I wanted a story from her. And I was wrapped when I got it. Oh, yeah. I did, did and I've it. got hers now already, and it's great. It is really, really good. Yeah, how many words does it come in at? Ah, uh, seventeen thousand. So it's a, it's a, it's a novella. Oh wow! It's quite a good one, and I'll, I'll give you first scoop on it. It's set within the Korean War. Wow! Yeah, that sounds like it's going to be an interesting one. Yes, well, she, her, her dad, I believe, served in the Korean War. Um, her dad, Steve Perry, not the singer, but the also the <laughs> tie-in novelisation writer. Yeah. Um, and she collaborated with him on a few books, especially with the Aliens and the Alien Predator series, and she got him to look over it. So there's a lot of in- input there from him in regard to this, the reality of the setting, um, the weapons and everything like that. So it's it's going to be factual in its fictional settings which i'm really excited about it's a great story and i know people are going to love it Mm. is there anything else you can tell us about it or is it kind of too early at the moment to divulge too many details (laughs) i don't want to give away too many details people will just have to buy snafu survival of the fittest and and see whether it's their cup of tea or not and i think with the cover art we've got for that i think it's going to get a lot of attention too. We've got a great cover artist for the Snafu series, very lucky. He's worked with Stephen King before and with Clyde Barker, so the fact he's working with us, I'm, I feel privileged. Very, very good. And he's a UK artist as well. Yeah, who, who is it that you've got on board? Uh, his name's Dan Samed. He, he, he works under the, um, the name of Conspiracy Digital Art. And for small press and for self-publishers, he gives a great rate. For he, he gives a sliding scale, so for the bigger publishers, he'll charge more. But he'll really look after the um, small presses and the self-publishers, and I highly recommend him. He's very easy to work with. He's great imagination. His technical skills are amazing. And he's an all-around nice guy. So, yeah, Conspiracy Digital Arts. And for small presses that do want to work with him, what's the kind of starting rate? You look at two fifty US, mm. around about three hundred US, somewhere around that scale, which is uh, it's it's not much for a world quality cover. Yeah, and I think I mean it's something that I've seen you bang on about, particularly on Facebook. I mean, a, a, having a good looking cover is so important, and unfortunately, within within the indie scene, you do see some pretty terrible covers i mean of course not in all cases <laughs> oh, yes. but I, I i think maybe when people are looking at how can i cut costs they're thinking well maybe if i pay a lesser cover artist but but for me i mean that the cover that's the first thing that people are going to see so the cover needs to be as good as the writing really 
Absolutely. People say don't judge a book by a cover, but everybody does. Yeah. You know, you're looking at Amazon, all you see is thumbnails and you're scrolling through. You get the um, emails from ebook notification services like BookBub and Book Gorilla, and you just scroll through. And if a cover grabs your eye, then you'll look at the synopsis. And the synopsis is the second part of the hook, but the cover's the first. You've got to get people's attention. The cover's got to tell you what you're going to get out of the book. And I think the Snafu covers do that mm. <laughs> quite well. No, I think looking at the Cohesion Press covers, probably my favourites are the Snafu Survival of the Fittest. And then actually, I really like the Carnies cover by Martin Living's. That's a fantastic yes. cover. Yeah, Carnies is great. I mean, how can you go wrong with, with Carnival Folk? It just screams brilliant cover art. Mm. That was actually by a, an earlier cover artist of ours that has now switched back to fine art and doesn't do covers so much. Ah. And, yeah, she she did some really, really great work with that. A lot of that is, is actually hand-created. The sign with the um, carnival's name and mm. everything on it, all hand-created. I've done the fonting on most of them, although Dean from Conspiracy does all the fonting as part of the service. Um, but... Yeah, the, the cover art of Carnies is fantastic. It really is. It's very moody and, and, and expresses quite well what the book's about to a, to a degree anyway. And how have the novels and novellas done for you? I mean, I, I can only assume from the fact that you're concentrating on Snafu that obviously that is the major title that has done the best, but in terms of attracting attention with the novels and novellas, has that been fairly successful i mean i know it's, it's hard when you're running an indie press um particularly to try and get mainstream attention because either they only really cover the traditional publishers releases or they want a physical uh, advanced review copy which sometimes just isn't actually possible to produce I've got no problem with sending out physical review copies, especially to the bigger reviewers, but they just get inundated with requests for reviews, and it's very hard to get promotion going, no matter how good the product, no matter how good the cover, and no matter how good the writer. And for us, Snafu is what is putting us on the map. I mean, the, these authors have got fan bases of tens of thousands in some cases, so people are starting to pay attention to Snafu and the sales figures are showing. The others are slowly picking up. It can take up to a year or two for a, a novel to really get its, 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 no, its grind going. And they're selling okay, and I was always of the impression that this would be the long term. You know, I wasn't looking for short term profits. Mm. I was looking for to break even after a few years and maybe start making profits a little bit after that. Snuffer has helped bring that closer. But yeah, it is hard to get books out there. I mean I've we focus on horror. Our very first release was by Karen Warren, who's a multi award winning Australian writer. She's won the Shirley Jackson Award and won the uh, she's been a, a finalist for the um, World Fantasy Award. So she's known, but getting the work out there for people, there's so many books now you can buy. Why should people buy new books when their you know, their favorite authors are putting out a book every three months? You've got to hook something and give them something new. I mean, we focus on horror, but we've put out two cat books, which aren't doing too bad. They're you know, one of the internet cat sensations, and we did that because we thought, well, this is different. You know, this may get people's attention, and they have. They're selling reasonably well. Magoo Who, the story of a blind cat that lived for three years on its own in... in um, in an American city, which is quite an achievement, really. Yeah. But I, I'm, I'm narrowing my focus back to military horror. That's what I love, and that's what I love to read, so that's what I'll put out. Yeah, maybe one day there'll be a, a cat meets military horror anthology. <laughs> <laughs> we'll tap into that's that. That's an meet. interesting concept. <laughs> yeah. M maybe, Michael maybe. Wilson ahead cancers. of the curve. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, the next genre. But you've got to take chances. You know? You've got to put your money where your, where your mouth is. And if you don't take the risk and do it properly, then there's something wrong. As long as you don't get ahead of yourself and just become an author farm and put out 
30, 40, 50 books a year and just hope that one of them hits the mark because none of them will ever be as good as it could be. No. And in terms of getting attention and in terms of the marketing, what is... I, I in fact, I, I've spoken to you a little bit about this on Facebook, but what is a tactic that you didn't think would work that did work for you and then also a tactic you did think would work that didn't? Well, tactic I didn't think would work and did very little. There's, we've really had a hard time making traction in regard to to marketing. It's the hardest part of anything to do with publishing because what works for one book won't work for a second. It won't work. For, what works for one writer won't work for a different one. It, it's it's basically a blind man throwing darts all around and hoping one of them hits a balloon that he doesn't even know where it is. Um, our strongest marketing so far has been what I mentioned earlier, getting the name writers who already have an established fan base. That's what's got us the sales. I mean, I've paid for advertising on websites and, yeah, you get some hits from that but not what I'd hoped. Um, I've paid for the um, subscription, you know, where people sign up for subscription of e cheap e-books and these places have mailing lists of half a million people and you'd think that that would get some sales and we got a few hundred sales out of that but not what I expected. We, we broke even but uh, we didn't make a great profit although that has had some ongoing rise in sales so over the long term it may. Again, I'm still experimenting. I really am. There's just nothing I can say that has done anything apart from getting those names on the covers. Daniel Perry, Jeremy Robinson. I mean, Jeremy sits in the top hundreds of Kindle sales every time he releases a new book, and he's in Snafu too, so I'm hoping that that's going to flow over a little bit and get Snafu there. But keep, we keep putting them out, and every time we put a new one out, the old ones sell more. So I think that applies to publishers as much as it does to writers. Just keep publishing. And of these named authors, who are, let's say, the top four named authors that you'd most like to get in an anthology for Cohesion Press? Oh, that's, 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 that's a good one. I asked Matthew Riley whether he'd be willing to give us a short story, and he said, um, not at the moment, I'm a little bit busy, but how about you send me a copy of the book and I'll keep you in mind, so that's a good start. I'd love to get Matthew Riley, definitely, because he, he sells like you know, ice in the Sahara, in the Sahara. He's just a, his name on there would just sell thousands of copies. I'd like to get Joe Hill, but he doesn't write military horror. I'm, I'm tapping the market I want at the moment, really, when it comes to focused military horror writers. I've got Joseph Nassis, who's you know, well published with military style horror. I've got Jeremy Robinson. He was always a, a bucket list writer for me, and he's quite happy to to give us a story. I've got Wes Oaks, and again, bucket list writer. Jonathan Mabry, bucket list writer. I'm, I'm getting the people I want. Oh, I'd love to get right, put out an anthology with Joe Hill and with Stephen King and with Robert McCammon, but that's not what we're focusing on at the moment. You said that Joe Hill doesn't write military horror, but I think sometimes, and we touched on this with the Broken River Books podcast, uh, a writer will really bring quite a lot when they're writing within a subgenre that they don't normally write within. So it might be interesting to reach out to some of these authors who don't normally write military horror and, and see if they're up for the challenge in what they produce. Oh, absolutely. Don't worry, I plan to. I'll be asking King and Hill and <laughs> McCammon and all those. But yeah, it would be nice to get them, definitely. And Joe Lansdale, I'd love to have a Joe mm. Lansdale story. I've actually, we've had Lansdale in the Australian Horror Writers Association magazine one time. And it was a pleasure to work with Joe. I did the editing for that. So that was great fun. And, and I love Joe's writing. I love the Happen Leonard stuff. It's one of my favourite genres, that sort of Southern Gothic. Mm. So I've got plans for a Southern Gothic anthology at one point. And for that, I'd love Joe Lansdale. I'd love Robert McCammon, who wrote Gone South, amongst all these other styles of writing that was a very strong southern gothic style so yeah there's a lot of writers out there I'd, I'd love to get but i've got a few that i am glad i have mm. 
No, I think you've done very well so far, and I am interested to see where co cohesion goes from here. Yes, well, hopefully it's up from this point. Yes. We've, we're, we're, we're breaking even, so that's good. We're getting mm. back what we what we spent. We started off with a nice chunk of money in because we knew that you can't start this sort of business with without you know, with less than ten or twenty thousand dollars in the bank to to cover the the costs initially. Mm. So yeah, we we started off with with the right amount of money. We did it properly, and with luck, I think we're still doing it properly. We're focusing on what we want. We're penetrating the market in a very narrow genre at the moment, and that gives you the best penetration. And you you've put some of your books on Kindle Unlimited. Can you tell us a little bit about the success you've experienced with that? Yeah, well, that that was always something I wanted to experiment with, but there's always people who want stuff on the other platforms. But I thought with, with Snuffy Heroes, it's a reprint anthology of four big-name writers. There was four novellas in there, or sorry, three novellas and a short story, but they're all fairly rare pieces of writing, stuff that hasn't had a lot of exposure. And I put that on Snuffy, on Kindle Unlimited just to see how it went. And... We're looking at probably between 25 and 35 percent of the sales are through Kindle Unlimited, and in comparison to what I was getting from all the other platforms combined, the Apple iStore, Kobo, Nook, um, Smashwords itself, I'm making just as much from the Kindle Unlimited sales, and there's a lot less work involved. There's a lot less regard to working out the royalties because it's all in one lot. There's a lot less work in formatting the documents because I only have to format one and that's straight onto Kindle. Mm. I mean, that's not relevant for one that's, that's um, the earlier stuff, although I have taken Snafu from the other, the original Snafu from the other distributions and put that on Kindle Unlimited recently and that's starting to show the same level of sales. And with the Kindle application you can get for iPad and for iPhone and with Calibre which is a file conversion program people can buy the file from Amazon and convert it to suit their own reader anyway because we don't use digital rights management there's no none of the digital rights management protection on our files I find that limits what people can do and it certainly doesn't stop piracy because you can strip DRM in 20 seconds no matter how good it is yeah I, I agree and both in terms of what I've done with this as horror and in terms of working with other bigger presses, I find that the attitude generally is let's just have it DRM free because as you say, it's not going to stop piracy and actually what you're doing is limiting the reader experience for those who are prepared to pay for the book. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the thing that's going to stop piracy is keeping the cost down and making things freely available globally all at the same time. And that's what we do. We don't have anything dearer than five ninety nine, and we never will. We reduce all our pricing three to six months in, and we have great specials where sometimes you can pick up some of our best books for 99 cents. Mm. And you and find those 99 cents offers go down particularly well? Yeah, the sales go up, the profits go down per per um per book, but you get the distribution and you get the extra reviews and you get read by people who wouldn't have read you at, at six dollars. They'll quite happily read you at, at ninety nine cents, although I'd never go free because I think there's too many free books and if people get something for free, then they're probably not gonna read it. Yeah. No, I think that's a a fair comment and in fact when we were talking about Kindle Unlimited with J. David Osborne of Broken River Books one of his concerns was because you can effectively loan these books for free even though you're paying you know seven quid or so each month he wondered if people load up their Kindle with these free rentals and then effectively don't read it um, now, for me, the bigger concern was are there people who have Kindle Unlimited who are then buying the books that I'm putting out 
via Kindle Unlimited and then that's taking away from actual sales because they're just renting them because it's cheaper. Is that a concern for you? Is that, is that I mean, have you been doing this long enough uh, really to notice a correlation? Probably not. Our first Kindle Unlimited book was Heroes and that came out October 31st. So two and a half months, but in that two and a half months, I've seen enough Kindle Unlimited purchases, I call them still purchases because I'm still getting paid for them. Yeah. Maybe not quite as much, but close. And I've seen enough to think that it's worthwhile. And people must be reading them because you don't get paid until they read 10%. Yeah, and and also, I mean, I hadn't looked into this when we did the J. David Osborne podcast, so couldn't point it out. But you can you can only loan, uh, so you can only borrow ten books at a time. So yes, you couldn't load it up uh, indefinitely, <laughs> you know. And I I actually do have Kindle Unlimited, and for me, it's. As with when I purchase a book, I kind of get it on the Kindle when I want to read it. Because otherwise, it just clogs up the Kindle anyway, and I can't actually find the things I want to read when <laughs> I want to read them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think that's what most people will do. You'll probably get a few who just grab their 10 a month and only manage to read three a month, and then they just go back. But if they want to read something, they'll get it next month anyway. Mm. And I'm counting on the, the the reputation of Snafu as being high quality fiction, every single story being at least fantastic, to get people to read us. And why why take up only a ten slots with something you're not interested in reading? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Danny. And ten a month, that's not a lot of books. Yeah. You know, that that's yeah, over think- twenty books a year. The whole kind of um, free book aspect that you touched on before, I mean, we spoke about this, didn't we, With uh, when we were talking about yeah. Broken River books. Um, the free books, you know, regardless of what it is, if you don't pay for it, I think, you know, certainly for me, almost psychologically as a reader, that goes lower down, you know, you to be read piled and something that you're willing to pay two or three quid for to download from, you know, if you've gone out of your way to purchase something, you know, you're more likely to instinctively pick up something that's free because of the price rather than the quality, if that makes sense. Um, so it does. I think I think I think that to some extent what you know what Jeff's saying about, you know, not giving something away for free, I think it does have, the price sometimes does have a psychological impact on the reader because I know that it does does on me really. Yeah, what, what Absolutely, I, will, I agree. What I would say to that is in terms of my own Kindle Unlimited purchases, um you know, I wouldn't download something unless it was something I was prepared to buy anyway. Because I, I think time is a premium. That's perhaps a cost that some people don't always factor in. But I'll look if something's on Kindle Unlimited that I would buy anyway. So in fact, in my case, if I'm borrowing your book on Kindle Unlimited, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> I am taking away from your profit. <laughs> Because I would have bought it anyway, but that's just my end, approach. It's being, <laughs> it's being read, and if Kindle Unlimited gets us more readers, even if it's only 50% of the Kindle Unlimited people wouldn't have got it without KU, then that's an extra 5, 10, 20, 100 readers a month. Yeah, and I, I think in terms of Amazon, as opposed to putting something out with Apple or Smashwords or any of the other channels, for me, whatever publisher I've worked with, 80 to 90% of sales are coming through Amazon. Um, Absolutely. Maybe, My figures are pretty much exactly that, 80 to 90% of sales. Amazon. Yeah, maybe 5 or so, 5 to 8% through Apple. And then yep. the... so. I would only ever bother with Amazon and Apple because I think the time that you put into putting these books on other platforms isn't actually worth what you get out of it. And 
to be honest, given the bonuses that you can get from putting it out exclusively through Kindle. So for those who don't know, you can be part of Kindle Unlimited, which means that people can borrow your book as part of a subscription. It's kind of like a Netflix for literature. And you're also put into the Kindle lending library, which I understand is a very similar thing. It might even be that Kindle Unlimited has now replaced that. I'm not sure. And then the other two interesting perks. One is that if you wanted to, you could put your book out for free. Now, as Jeff says, that's not something he does. That is something I've experimented with, but I can't really say that the outcome was that favorable. I mean, the logic, the logic is pretty much this. If you're an author that has got a series, you might be tempted to put the first one out for free in the hope that people then get invested and buy the others. But I think if you're operating in any other way, it's probably not going to work out too much to your favor. Uh, but the other interesting perk is you can run these Kindle countdown deals. Which I believe is probably what you've been doing, Jeff, in terms of discounting things to 99 cents. Um, I've actually changed the pricing to 99 cents. I haven't run a countdown deal as yet because the ones I've wanted to, you have to have had a stable price for 90 days prior to it and the prices weren't stable. So I'm waiting to start the first Kindle countdown deal. Mm. And to your point of the 99 cents to uh, to free for the first in the series, I think 99 cents for the first in the series would work just as well, if not better, because as it was touched on earlier, if people get it for free, they might not even read it. Mm. If they pay 99 cents, which, every, I mean, personally, I can speak from experience and discussions I've had with other people. If I see something on Amazon that's 99 cents and it looks cool, I'll grab it. And because I've paid 99 cents for it, I'll read it. If I see something on Amazon that looks cool and it's free, I'll grab it and I'll forget about it 10 minutes later. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think you're better off pricing at 99 cents. You're probably going to get a few less sales, but out of the sales you do get, you're going to get a lot more reads. And they will go on then to buy the rest of the series for the $3 and $4 pricings that they are. And in, in terms of when you have put things up for 99 cents, have you ever had any readers kind of have a bit of a backlash or get a bit angry with you because they've noticed that you've, you've put it at 99 cents and in scenario one, they've very recently bought it for free 99 and they feel a bit disgruntled that they could have saved uh, three pounds or three bucks. Um, or in the other scenario, someone has missed the deal and now they've decided to take it out on you and say you know can't you reduce this to 99 cents for me i've never had that once never had it once all i've received in regard to especially the snafus which is the ones i've been focusing on switching the prices around here and there to try and get more readers i've received nothing but positive feedback in regard to pricing quality of stories and everything else and most often the comment that precedes everything is hey when's the next snafu coming out we want more mm. so i'm happy with that yeah i know gareth jones who occasionally writes for this as horror and more frequently writes for dread central has had nothing but praise to say about snafu He's a big fan, and that, that's a good. good a good kind of person, a good uh, website to get endorsing your books. <laughs> awesome. Well, I mean, you put quality out and people will see. The readers who see it, who read it, will say, well, this was great. I'm going to keep an eye out for the next one. You check all their reviews. They're all really good apart from a couple that came in within a day of each other, and neither of them really seem to have read the book. I don't understand where they came from, but there's always going to be a couple of people who don't like it. But overwhelmingly, our reviews have been fantastic across the board. So you put out the quality and people will start to take notice. Mm. No, that's fantastic. And in terms of quality, who else do you recommend that our readers seek out? Are there any up-and-coming authors that you think people should be aware of and reading? 
Um, I'd certainly keep an eye out for Neil F. Litherland. He's been in one of the snafu. He's in the first snafu, and he's in the upcoming Wolves at the Door. Um, I'd certainly keep an eye out for Deborah Sheldon if you like crime noir, sort of dark, moody subgenre, underbelly sort of stuff. We've got uh, one of her books out that has two short novellas in, or two novellas, sort of um, one's a um, centred around the outlaw bikey world and the other is just how low will one person sink for love? What are they willing to do? Um, I'd certainly check out Greg Beck's stuff. He's been in Snuffy before. And as far as publishers go, the uh, publisher that I really, really wish I could do as well as that's around the same age as us, and that's Ragnarok Publishing in the US. Really, really, really good guys, and they put out some great stuff. Okay, that that sounds great. Thank you. It's it's always difficult when you get recommendations. Always try and make some like mental notes of things to pick <laughs> up. So when it gets to this point in a podcast, I always try and you know make sure that it, when I kind of come across these books, I you know add them to wish lists and you know put them in baskets and stuff like that on Amazon so I can you know remember to pick up pick up all the recommendations oh, I get. So yeah, I'm always just one other, one other to keep an eye out for. American writer Jack Hansen. He's put out, um, t- he's just about to release his second sci fi military, and his work is just amazing. The first one, Cry Havoc, it's called. It, it, it reads the um, your classic military academy in the future. It's almost like there's, there's a touch of halo to the feel. And then you get the weaponized intelligent dinosaurs, and it just kicks. It is so good. I could not put the first one down, and I read the second before it was out because I did layout for him, um, digital layout, and, yeah, the guy is amazing. Great, great writer, Jack Hansen. I highly recommend his stuff. It's certainly a name to watch out for. Nice one. And do you have any film recommendations? I know that one of my favourite films and one of Dan's was actually the Australian film The Babadook of last year. Which I haven't seen yet. Oh, I don't have time to watch films, really. Yeah. So I'll put them on and, and then just keep working. Although I did really enjoy Mama. That was out a couple of years ago. Oh, yes. I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, I just don't get time to watch a lot of TV, really. It'll be on in the background of a night time, but I don't pay much attention. No. Oh, should should the carve an hour and a half out of your schedule to watch the Babadook. I don't think you'll regret yes, that. Yes, we've, we've got it. I just haven't had a chance to watch it yet, so I'll throw the disc <laughs> in at some point, definitely. I've heard nothing but great great reviews for that one. Okay, and where can our listeners connect with you? Well, I'm on Facebook all day, every day, as I said earlier. Um, Jeff Brown. Um, we've got a web uh, Facebook page for Cohesion Press, and I'm on there fairly often. And I've got my own website, uh, gnbraun.com, B-R-A-U-N, which is the pen name I write under, and cohesionpress.com as well. And to finish, how about one tip for people editing, one tip for people writing, and one tip for people looking at starting a small press? For editing, um, cut out any word, any sentence, any paragraph that doesn't serve a purpose. If it doesn't push the for- story forward, if it doesn't help with character development, it's not necessary. And get rid of those adverbs and adjectives. I hate them. <laughs> 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 and also give it to somebody else to look at. Um, for writing, always get somebody else to look over your stuff. Never self-publish without letting somebody else, you know, a professional or at least somebody who really knows the genre, to do it and never self-publish without a good cover. And for the publishing side of things, do it properly. You know, start off with a bit of money, take your time, investigate the genre and focus, focus in the genre. Don't just throw out things like darts and hope that one of them hits the target. All right. Make haste slowly. (laughs) Yeah, I think those are some great takeaways. And thank you very much for taking time out of your clearly incredibly busy schedule. (laughs) so much on to talk with us i think there's a lot of good stuff that's come out of this podcast and 
I'm sure that at a future date we could get you on to talk about things a little bit more if you want. Absolutely, I'm more than open to it. A, it's a great promotion, but it gives me a chance to talk about the things I love. So, <laughs> yeah, if you want to go deeper into the publishing side of things, I'm more than happy to, or anything you want. And it's been a real pleasure. Okay, yeah, cool. thank you very much. And as I said at the start, really nice to kind of connect a voice and to actually talk to you via Skype rather than just back and forth on emails and Facebook. <laughs> yes, it's been a, a couple of years now, and this is the first time we've heard each other's voices. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> All right, well, you take care of yourself and speak to you soon. No worries. Thanks heaps for the opportunity, and anytime you want to run this again, give me a yell. Yeah, no worries. All right, see you soon then. Nice one, Jeff. Cheers, mate. Yep, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Michael. Have a good afternoon and <laughs> evening. <laughs> yeah, all right, no worries. <laughs> see you then. Bye-bye. Nice bye. one. See ya. See bye. ya. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please just take 30 seconds to go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating, and if you're feeling really generous, leave us a review. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us pay for the various associated costs, such as the hosting, then please do go to the This Is Horror shop and purchase one of our books. You can also shop through our affiliate links, which you'll find in the show notes. You'll be able to find the This Is Horror shop at thisishorror.co.uk and also at thisishorror.co.uk. In the right-hand navigation, you can sign up for our This Is Horror newsletter and keep up to date with everything. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.